Good. We're still in Hebrews 12, and uh, this afternoon will be shorter. I, I don't know. I don't remember uh, what I did this morning. Did I introduce my family this morning? No. No? Okay. Excuse me. <clears throat> my wife is there, Amanda, and Eli is our oldest. He's six. Tessa is four, and Gideon is in the nursery. He's two and a half, and so uh, they're here, and I'm thankful for them. They're wonderful and uh, my wife is wonderful. I'm thankful for her. She's what I needed. So the Lord knew that, right? Um, so he, he gives us the help meet, the one that, one that we need. So I thank God for her, and I thank God for enabling us to be in the ministry down there together. And um, uh, the Lord uh, using us, and who are not worthy to be uh, even called his children, let alone his servants. So we're thankful for that. But uh, we're back in Hebrews 12. And we're dealing with the idea of enduring from the book of Hebrews. And we're in chapter 12, and I'm just going to uh, read again from chapter 12, verse 1, down through verse 13. So if you could follow along, and then we'll ask God to bless the time. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with, ra with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how you use it in our hearts and how you have a, a special word for each one of us when we come to, come to it. And I thank you for the word of exhortation that we hear today. And I thank you for your word to Bible Baptist Church and to each one of its members and to myself. And we thank you for it. And I pray that you use it again in our hearts this afternoon. We ask you these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We're con continuing considering these things regarding the Lord Jesus Christ, and we saw first Jesus' princely authorship, and then we saw his perfecting accomplishment, and then before we quit, which was a little bit too long, we saw his persevering action, he endured. And that's really the key verb phrase of the passage that Jesus Christ endured, and he wants us to understand some things about Jesus, why he endured, how he endured, some things about the Lord Jesus Christ, and one of those things is right here in verse chapter 2, or, or uh, Chapter 12, verse number 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the same. And so I want shame, and I want you to see the anticipation of Jesus, but not just the anticipation as if it's something future, but the present anticipation of Jesus. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in our English mind, but the present anticipation of Jesus. In other words, what was he looking forward to that was in the present, that was right there uh, for him to experience? When you come to church on Sunday morning, you come expecting, don't you? But you're not expecting something that's in the future. You're here. And so you're expecting something now. And so you're seeing God's will for you right in front of your face. As you pull into the church parking lot, you're seeing this is the place where God's people meet. Not that it's the building, but you understand what I'm saying. You're seeing the opportunity to be a minister to the uh, before the Lord, to use your spiritual gift in his church for the edification of the body, to be encouraged and strengthened and challenged by the word of God, to receive a word from somebody else, to do a, a, a physical task that is a service to the Lord, and to uh, worship the Lord as he commands us to do on his day. And so these are things that we're anticipating, but they're things that are also present. It's a, it's a present thing, but it's 
we, we anticipate it. And that's the way Jesus was, because the Bible says here, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The joy that was set before him. The idea of it being set before him was not just something that it was a far off uh, a thing in the future. For instance, if you can see a long distance and see maybe a target way down the line, or maybe you're a, a runner in a race and you can see the finish line way down there, it wasn't just that. It wasn't just the idea of reaching the end of it. It was the doing of it. You say, well, was Jesus enjoying what he was going through? No, not at all. In fact, he says that. Look at verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. He's talking about what you're going through in the moment. It doesn't seem to be joyous. Joyous. Doesn't seem to be what? Joyous. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. And so he is uh, enduring the cross with joy. How did he do that? How did he have joy set before him? How, what was the joy? What was the, the joy in going through what he was doing? The joy in going through what he was going through was that he was doing the Father's will. He was doing the Father's will. And so as he, that's at least part of it, I'm sure that it's multifaceted, but that's at least part of it that he was doing the Father's will. He said, I delight to do thy will. We'll consider some of these verses. Uh, what was driving the Lord Jesus? The joy of Jesus was to do the Father's will in the present. It was to do the Father's will in the present. Consider a few verses with me. Go back to Psalm chapter 40. And these will be familiar, but uh, remember them and apply them to this context. Psalm chapter 40, verse 8. I guess not chapter, but Psalm 40. Verse 8. Of course, this is messianic. Verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Over in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering, and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. So in looking at the law and realizing that it was ineffective to a certain point, Jesus said, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And that's a joy of Jesus Christ, to do the will of God. I delight to do thy will. He found his joy, his satisfaction in doing the will of God. I just read through Ecclesiastes like maybe three weeks ago. Uh, and in that book, you find someone who was doing all the time, doing this, doing that, doing things for pleasure, doing things for uh, accomplishment's sake, doing things for pride's sake, doing things for fleshly lust's sake, doing things. And do you know how much joy he found in all of that? Zero. No, no joy in doing any of that because he was doing his will. He was not doing God's will. When it's God's will, it can be those menial things, not the sinful things, but the menial things such as building or, uh, or working or learning any of those things. They can be God's will for us. Uh, and if we are doing things in God's will, then they can be joyful to us, and they will be joyful to us. God's will is not always fun. God's will is not always easy. God's will is sometimes difficult, and God's will is sometimes hard. But when we're doing God's will, that's when we can have joy. Some of the most joyful people I have ever met are the people who are going through the hardest trials. Now, how does that make any sense? It doesn't, really, humanly speaking. But the people who are going through the hardest trials are often the people who have the most joy. Not always, because sometimes they don't have the right perspective on it. But many, many times I've gone into somebody's home who was struggling, somebody who had physical trials, somebody who had suffered a death in the family, or somebody who was uh, uh, enduring a, a, a breakup in the home, or, or a, a trouble with a child, whatever it might be, and they would look at the situation, and they would realize God was at work, and they would say, praise God. They would say, I, the Lord is blessing me. The Lord is really helping me through this. They'd show, share a verse. Uh, and you would realize when you left that place that you got encouraged by going to visit that person. Have you ever been in that position? You go to encourage somebody and you come away encouraged. Why? Because that person is experiencing the joy of the Lord while going through a trial. So when we're going through a trial, when we're going through a difficulty, they're difficult. They don't seem to be joyous. It's not easy. But we can have the joy of the Lord in that trial. And whatever trial that you go through as Bible Baptist Church and whatever individual trial you go through as its members, you can have joy in that trial because you can see what God is really doing in your life and because you can see that it's God's will. When it's God's will, you can be happy in it. 
When it's God's will, you can be joyful in it. You can feel fulfilled in it, is the idea. You can find God's peace, which he mentions at the end of this section, uh, verse 14, follow peace with all men. And he says it yieldeth, uh, chasing yieldeth the, the uh, peaceable fruit of righteousness. Joy and peace always go together. That's a, that's a, you can't separate the two. They're two sides of the same coin, joy and peace. Uh, that, that's, that's what we have in the Lord when we're doing his will. Jesus was doing the will of God, so even when he was enduring such contradiction of sinners against himself, he had the joy of the Lord. Can you imagine that? He had the joy of the Lord even when he was on the cross because he was doing the will of God. Turn back to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, and we'll look at verse 34. We'll, we'll come back up to verse 31. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Of course, he's teaching them a lesson, as he always was. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? What's he talking about? You can, you, have you ever been with somebody and they're trying to make some point and, and you're like, what's he talking about? And uh, not to be irreverent, but that's what they were doing. They said, did you, did you bring him something? I didn't, I didn't bring anything. No. And then the Lord had to make the point. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's what's important to me. That's what satisfies me. That's what makes me feel full. That's what fulfills me, is to do the will of God. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And we must all come to that place in our life where my meat is to do the will of him that sent me, as the Lord Jesus did, as our Example, uh, turn over to chapter 15. John chapter 15. Some of you will already know where we're headed. Verse 10. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. What's he talking about? Keeping and abiding in something? How about enduring in something, right? Uh, uh, remaining in something? And he says, these things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you, in you because you're doing my commandments. You're keeping my will. You're doing my will. And that your joy may be full. Now, you can do a lot of things in this life that will give you some joy. You can, you can uh, I like to hunt and fish, not, not, uh, crazy, but I like to do it when I, when I get a chance. Uh, I hear it's difficult up here, so. Uh, I like to do, I like to play sports when I get the chance. Uh, what else do I like to, like to build things when I get the chance? Those things give me joy. But in my life, if I were to be doing those things all the time, they would not give me full joy, even if I did them all the time. And all of you can think of something like that in your life, that it would give you joy, but it doesn't give you full joy. Jesus gives us full joy, and doing his will gives us full joy. By the way, when we do his will, often he gives us opportunities to do things we never thought we could do. I've, I've, uh, I'm not a world, who was I talking to? Uh, Terry, Miss Terry, where's she at? Yeah, she said she loves to travel, okay? I like to travel, but I, you know, when, I was a, when I was young, a young person, I thought I'd travel. I'll probably stay right here in Pennsylvania my entire life. I have been in all but five states, and I've been to South America, and I've been to or Central America, and I've been to Europe, uh, traveling in the service of the Lord, and it's been wonderful. And uh, I've been in New Hampshire too. So you know, uh, uh, it, but when you're in the will of God, you get to—he he gives you extra blessings. So we shouldn't always look at it as a negative thing doing the will of God. But He gives full joy. He gives full joy. God gives full joy, and when we're doing His will. All right, Romans chapter 14. My wife said that I'm not allowed to be as long in the afternoon. <clears throat> yeah, I said I probably won't be. And she said, no, don't be. No, I'm just. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of forceful. Yeah. <laughs> Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace, and joy, and the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ 
is acceptable to God and approved of men. When we do God's will, when we do what's serving the Lord, we'll have joy and peace. All right, chapter 15, say, stay in Romans, chapter 15, verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the gospel. Uh, abound in hope through the power of the gospel because you're believing. Joy and peace because you're believing, because you're doing his will. Uh, following the Lord brings joy and peace. Verse 32, he says, and this is a prayer regarding being delivered. Uh, not an easy thing. Verse 30, now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. Does it sound like a he's going, really easy thing that he's going through? Strive together with me in prayer. What He's saying, I really need some prayer here. What I'm about to do is going to be a difficult thing. There's uh, robbers and thieves along the way. There's people who want to persecute me along the way. There are uh, uh, especially those who, in verse 31, those who do not believe in Judea, who are not only trying to get the money that I'm bringing, but they would like to see me imprisoned and, and uh, killed. And so I need you to strive for me in prayer, with me in prayer, for me. <laughs> That's what he asked for. Why? Verse 32, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God. When you're in the will of God, you can be pressed, you can be under pressure, you can be persecuted, but you can still have the joy of the Lord because he said, whatever the will of God is, that's where I'm going to find my joy. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. He says, great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Oh, bunch of nonsense. All right, chapter, verse 13. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceedingly the, the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you. Here, here they're in the will of God, able to get joy, able to find joy because they're operating in the will of God. Chapter 8, verse 2. He's talking about the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of, of affliction, the abundance of their joy, great trial of affliction, abundance of joy. These are opposite. These are polar opposites, but they're connected by the will of God. So if, if, if our trial, if our suffering, if the thing that we're going through is connected to the will of God, then we can have joy in it. Then we can have joy in it. They had great joy. They had abundant joy. Uh, in the Lord. All right, we're going to continue on. Colossians chapter 1, verse 11. He says, uh, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, uh, unto all patience and long suffering, with joyfulness, enduring it in joy, because you're in the will of God. All right, continue on. First Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter 1, and we'll come back to this passage, but 1 Peter 1, verses 8 and 9. He's talking about the trial of their faith in verse 7. Uh, verse 6, he says, You greatly rejoice in your salvation, though you're in heaviness now. Verse 8, Whom having not seen, ye love, and whom though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And what happens? Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. We will receive the promise uh, that is coming. All right? Don't ever lose the joy of serving Jesus. Amen. If you get out of the joy, focusing on Jesus Christ, you're going to lose the joy of serving him. Focus on what Jesus Christ did. Christ did. Uh, put your attention and your analyzing power on Jesus Christ. Focus on the Lord Jesus Christ when you're going through a difficult time, and you'll be able to have joy in it. But if you're doing, if you're doing what you're doing, even being here this afternoon, if you're doing it for uh, a preacher or you're doing it even for your fellow believer, these are great things. It's good to try to support somebody else and all of these things. But if that's the reason, if that's your main motivation, eventually it's going to get old. It's going to get old, and it's going to get tiresome, and you're going to get worn out and wearied in the battle, and you're going to faint. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. All right? Not only the present anticipation of Jesus, the joy that was set before him, was doing the will of God, but also the personal assessment of Jesus. In other words, what did Jesus think of his trial? 
You ever thought about that? How did Jesus consider what he was going through? Look at the, look at, look at the uh, passage in Hebrews. He says, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. And to answer that question, he does it right here, despising the shame. Despising the shame. Jesus' attitude toward what he went through on the cross was that he despised it. You say, well, when we think of the word despise, we think very negative. We think, uh, uh, Brother Kutcher, if I said I despise you, would, you, would we be friends? Probably not for very long, right? Okay. Uh, but the Greek word here doesn't have that always that really idea of animosity, that you hate something. It has the idea of really not caring. Uh, disregarding is the idea. So it would be as if maybe fathers, you've done this with your children, and you've said something to your son or daughter, and they kind of ignored you and went and did their own thing anyway, right? They disregarded your instruction. In other words, they didn't say, no, dad. They didn't stomp their foot or whatever. They just didn't do it, right? In other words, and, and that's to you, that's kind of a slap in the face because it's like they didn't care about it. Well, poor illustration probably, but that's how Jesus regarded his trial. I disregard it because he's comparing that to the joy set before him. What is better, to do the Father's will or to try to escape some sh physical shame, some temporary earthly struggle and trial and suffering and, and, a, and a chastening of the Lord? Uh, what, what is better and what is, uh, what, what is worse? Jesus despised the shame. His personal assessment of his trial was, uh, what trial? I, I, I despise the shame. He endured it because he was able to have a righteous opinion of it. His assessment of it was totally different. It was an eternal assessment, not a temporal assess assessment. It was an assessment of love. It was an assessment of accomplishment, what he was going to accomplish. Jesus' perspective of the shame that he suffered was that he disregarded it. Turn over to Acts chapter 20. Verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. What's he talking about? Affliction, trouble, things he had to endure through. Save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, Paul said, I don't know what's going to happen to me here, but it's not going to be good. Humanly speaking. And he said, the Holy Ghost told me that. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received with the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And he even said, you're not going to uh, uh, see my face anymore. Verse 25, I know that ye all shall see my face no more. And he said, none of these things move me. I love you. I don't want to leave you. Uh, it's going to be difficult. Bonds and afflictions are going to abide me or remain with me wherever I go. The Holy Ghost told me that. I know this is what I'm facing. But that doesn't move me one bit because I'm comparing doing the will of God, uh, really contrasting, saying the will of God is so much better than to uh, have a, a life of, of a perceived ease. Romans chapter 8. Verse 16, the reason I'm turning to all these passages is, is to show you the, the uh, progress of Scripture regarding enduring in the faith and how many did this and their perspective. And all of it is tied to the same attitude that Paul presents in Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may, also, we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared. That's why I say it's not really a comparison, it's a contrast. He says they're not really worthy to be compared. It's not a comparison. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. What is our perspective of the trial that we're going through? The shame that we bear? Uh, the, the stigma that can come into our lives for trusting in Jesus Christ, for doing his will, for being associated with his church? There's going to be a stigma with that. 
And Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. 1 Peter chapter 1 again, verse 6. And now we have Peter speaking to the same point, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In other words, whoever he was speaking to would uh, not have gold. They didn't have gold. They wished they had gold. And sometimes you and I might wish we had some more gold, right? But he says, the trial of your faith is more precious than gold. The difficulty that you go through is more precious than gold. Gold perishes. But our faith can be tried with fire, and it's found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So much more valuable. Jesus' assessment of his trial was that he despised the shame. Chapter 4 of 1 Peter, verse 12. He says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. So you have there God's perspective of the persecutors and you when you're going through a difficult time. Their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. When we go through these trials with a correct assessment of what's going on, not only the present anticipation of Jesus, the, past, the personal assessment of Jesus, but the powerful attaining of Jesus, because Hebrews chapter 12 says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame in the next phrase in verse 2, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And I have several passages. I won't turn you to all of them, but you know the passages. Even in Hebrews chapter 1, he talks about how Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. Many, many passages I have, uh, I won't count them. I probably have 10 written down here speaking about Jesus being at the throne or being at the right hand of God. The only one I'll turn you to is Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Jesus made himself, uh, let, this mind be of you, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself, made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If you, if you will turn there to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He speaks of the Son, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. That was what Jesus did when he went to heaven. He went to heaven and sat down. Because all the work that he needed to accomplish was accomplished. And because all of the power of the throne was his. Because he is God. And he sat on the throne at the right hand of the majesty on high. Continue on in the book of Hebrews to verse 13 of chapter 1. But unto which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies my footstool? Chapter 8, verse 1. Now the sum of the thing, now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. We'll talk about on next Sunday, we'll talk about our relationship to the one who's on the throne, the son who's on the throne. But this is the sum, he says. We've got a high priest who's on the throne. Uh, our high priest, our advocate, is also at the judgment bar uh, or, or at the judge's seat. He's in the same place. He's at the, right, he, he's at the right hand of God. He's our high priest, and he's there. All right, uh, chapter 10, verse 12. This man, 
After he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, what did he do? Sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. The powerful attaining of Jesus is that he is now at the right hand of the Father. He's been exalted. Jesus has been exalted. What was the result of Jesus Christ enduring in faith through all the trials? Exaltation. Jesus enduring through all of his trials, the result was exaltation, glorification, his powerful attain attainment. Not atonement, though that's true. Attainment. He attained exaltation because he endured what God had for him as the Son of Man on this earth. The powerful attaining of Jesus. I want to show you something. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And we have one more point after this and we're done, okay? Matthew chapter 8. So I know you're probably tired from eating, but hang in there. Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. We'll start in verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee wherever, whithersoever thou goest. Have you ever said that to the Lord? Lord, whatever you have for my life, that's what I'm going to do. This man said, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be right there. I'm going to be in the thick of it with you. Uh, I'm going to honor your word. I'm going to obey you. Jesus saith unto him, just so you know, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. In other words, if you want to identify with me, you're going to have to identify with hard times. You're going to have to identify with suffering. You're going to have to identify with being a stranger and a pilgrim on this earth, which is what Hebrews tells us. And we've got to confess openly that we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth and that we seek a city to come. And if you don't do that, then you're going to be discouraged and you're going to be lame and you're going to be wearied and faint in your minds and you're going to fall out of the way. Jesus saith unto him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. You say, well, brother, that's sad news. And uh, you're, you're just making us, you know, uh, try to endure and we have to just kind of get through this life. Not so. That's the first mention of the son of man in Matthew. First mention of Son of Man. I want to show you the last mention. Matthew chapter 26. The last mention of the Son of Man in Matthew chapter 26. Verse 62. The high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses, which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. He didn't need to say anything. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. It didn't matter to the high priest what Jesus said. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said whatever you say. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. The Son of Man, when he came, didn't have a place to lay his head. But when he comes the second time, he's coming in the right hand of power. That's what we have to look forward to. He's coming with all of his saints. We'll be with him. We will have the identification with Christ's power. And so when we look at the trials of this life, we can't compare them with the suffering that we have here. What we have here is so temporal and so small and so insignificant compared to then. And it's so hard for us to get our, our earthly minds outside of this earth and into spiritual things, into heavenly things. But when we do that, the trial that we're going through gets a little bit more bearable. It gets a little bit more endurable because we're focused on what Jesus Christ says what his attitude was, who he is, what he's done, the powerful attaining of Jesus. And then lastly, the practical attitude of Jesus. And this is an encouragement and a warning for believers as we depart this afternoon. Chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 2, or excuse me, verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, 
We already spoke about that, but I want you to see the last phrase of verse 3. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds, because that's the danger. Being wearied and faint in your minds, and verse 13, being lame and turned out of the way. That's the danger if we don't endure in faith. That's the danger if you start to say it's not worth it. That's the danger if you start to say so-and-so did this, so-and-so did that, therefore I'm, I'm forgetting the whole thing. That's the danger if we don't focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the danger if we don't look unto him and consider him, is that we can be wearied and faint in our minds. The practical attitude of Jesus was that he had a spirit of endurance. He had a spirit of endurance. And I'm going to turn you again to a few passages through the New Testament. Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Verse 1. And he spake a parable unto them to this end. What, what, what was Jesus' point? What, what, what lesson was he trying to teach them? That men ought always to pray and not to faint. And your relationship with the Lord, as we come into a difficult time, don't faint because your prayer wasn't answered the way you wanted it to be, because it wasn't answered the first time or the second time or the third time, or because you didn't receive the ultimate promise of the Lord. Don't faint. Men ought always to pray. Always to seek the Lord is the idea of that word for pray. Always to seek the Lord and not to faint. Continue looking to Jesus. Look to the Lord. Seek the Lord. Men ought always to pray and not to, pr not to faint. Second Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 1, therefore, seeing as we have received this ministry, as we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Verse 16, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day. That's what we need. We need the renewing of the inward man day by day for our light affliction, which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It's better and it's longer lasting. Amen. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13. Paul said, Wherefore, I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Now notice the connection here, that he would grant you, this is Paul's prayer, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. So that we have strength for the battle day by day, so that we have an eternal perspective on what's going on, be renewed in the inner man, strengthened in the inner man. Continue on. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And you'll, you'll uh, recognize this one. That's, I guess that's going back. I jumbled those ones. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season... We shall reap if we faint not. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Verse 13. But ye, brethren, in contrast to those who are walking disorderly, in contrast to those who are uh, not following God's commandments, but ye, brethren... Be not weary in well-doing. Just because there's somebody else maybe in God's church who's not doing right, don't be weary in well-doing. Just because you see someone fall by the wayside, don't be weary in well-doing. Say, it's get, it gets really old. Sure it does. If you, uh, let, me, let me just go out on a limb here. How many of you have been saved or in churches, shall I say, for 20 years or more? Okay, that's over half of you probably. All right, in 20 years, don't answer out loud. But just think about how many people you've seen go by the wayside. A lot. Doesn't it get old? It gets old. And you get frustrated. And why, why, why is this? Why is this? And you might think, well, 
because all this is happening, it doesn't matter if I am so dedicated to the Lord. Uh, why am I spending all this time over at the church? Why am I serving in this way? Why does this person demand so much of my time? Now, here's another person that I have to minister to and try to bring along, and they'll probably turn their back on me in a year or two also. If you have that attitude, you're going to faint and you're going to fall in the way. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And then I want to share with you, I, I call it my favorite verse. I have a lot of favorite verses, but I, I like this one. And I, I, use, I usually send my emails and stuff with it. Because uh, 1 Corinthians 15 is probably my favorite chapter in all of God's word. Because uh, it's such a logical argument that Paul puts forth regarding the gospel and regarding the resurrection and uh, regarding the things that are going on in this life. Uh, being in jeopardy every day, he talks about. Why, stand, why would we bother standing in jeopardy every day if the dead rise not? But they do. But you come to all, down to all these, all, all these things, and he talks about the rapture. Uh, in a moment, we shall, behold, I show you a, minute, a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Don't you look forward to that? For this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the pass this saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. In other words, there's a promise that we haven't fulfilled yet. These all died in faith, not having received the promise. Of course, that promise was Jesus Christ. We have that part of the promise, but there's, there's more promises to come for us. Then we'll receive that part of the promise. What's the promise? Death is swallowed up in victory, Isaiah 25, verse 8. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You got trials. You got difficulties. You got pressures. God gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's my verse. Therefore, my beloved brethren... Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding, overflowing in the work of the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain because of what Jesus Christ has done. Looking unto Jesus, uh, have your attention on Jesus, consider him, analyze Jesus Christ, and then you won't be weary and you won't faint in the way. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the encouragement that you've given to God's people and even to my own heart again today as we uh, delivered this. I thank you for your word. It's so, it's so uh, unsearchable. And uh, your truth and your ways and your mind is past finding out. So we thank you for what you've done for us today. And I thank you for the love that God's people here at Bible Baptist have shown to me and to my family. I pray that you bless them for it. Give us all wisdom, Lord, concerning the future. We want to know your will. Uh, we don't want to do any more or any less. And we want to be able to endure to the end and receive the, the uh, end of our faith, the salvation of our souls. We ask you these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, brother.